Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coast Community Church for worship this morning. Stand, sing some songs with us, and see if you can enter the presence of God, and we're going to do the best to facilitate that. Good All right. Let's get started. Surrendered everything I've got You can have everything I have And prepare everything I'm not Oh, I am willing, I'm not afraid You give me strength You 
All right, good morning, everyone. Who's already having a good time? Are you awake? Did y'all stay up late last night? Guess what? God's mercies, grace, spirit, power, everything is new every day. One person got that. Every day. See, sometimes we wake up thinking, man, I'm a little tired. I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I have the strength to do this. When we call on the name of Jesus, he is there to help us accomplish what he wants to accomplish every day. And because you are here, because you are here to receive the word of God into your heart, he has a plan of what is going to happen when you receive that. Not just into your ears, into your brain, but when you receive it into your heart. And that's just the truth of God's word. You say, well, you know, I don't know. If, you know, sometimes we put things in context of I'm feeling it, I'm not feeling it, I, I, whatever. But the word of God transcends all our feelings, all our thoughts, all our emotions, all everything. I just tell you, just buckle your seatbelt. You open your heart to him today. He's going to give you that word that it has for you today. Amen. All right, all right, all right. Welcome, 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 guest visit. Let's give our guests a round of applause. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you being here. As always, if you're joining us online, thank you for that as well. We are going to have the offering bags passed around for tithes, gifts, and offerings. So if you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. Don't feel like you have to give during this time. But um, as always, we thank you so, uh, so much for being here. Hopefully you got a lot of stuff done maybe yesterday. Maybe you're still enjoying this weather. I think it's going to get even colder. You know, we have to celebrate that any time that, that we can get that, get a little taste of that. We appreciate that. Uh, just a few announcements going on in the life of the church. Remember, we have uh, men's ministries that will meet on Tuesday at 6.30 here in the Activity Center. Uh, great study going on. Uh, enjoyed our time last week in uh, talking about prophecies and, and the fulfillment of prophecies from Old Testament to New Testament and about Christ. And it's pretty eye-opening. And hopefully you are here Wednesday as well for uh, small groups. If you haven't been here for small groups, we encourage you to be here on uh, Wednesdays at 6.30, having some great time. we got something if you're kids or teens or grown-ups or whatever, I'd uh, love to have you come and just get a little bit deeper in the Word, share uh, together, and really learn more about God and about each other in these uh, group experiences. So uh, excited to have that going uh, right now. Also remember, ladies are going to be having uh, ministry time today at the home of Rebecca Ray at 6 o'clock. She'd love to have you there. Um, as well as 
a reminder about Operation Christmas Child. If you got one of those boxes, and we know somebody got some boxes because we gave them all away. All 50 were given away. Now is the work. There you go. Hey, you can hand clap for that. There you go. There you go. Now you got to do, you got the box. Now we got to fill them up. So hopefully you, got, you still have your little instructions, your little labels, all the things that you need. If you're missing anything, anything, whatever, see Rebecca. She'll be glad to give you any more info, get you back on track uh, or whatever. So love to have those in ASAP. The sooner we can get those in, the better. Uh, remember, it's the box. You fill it up. And then the, there is a shipping fee of $10. Remember, we have someone uh, making a generous donation. Uh, if, you, uh, if it's a financial hardship to be able to do the $10 shipping, just go ahead and fill that box and bring it in. If you are blessed and able to do the $10 shipping, hey, please go ahead and do that. Uh, there will be no extra money. You say, well, how can that be? How, how much is being donated? How much? Will, don't worry about that. Whatever is coming in, whatever it is, whatever we bring in, is going to be used for that ministry and for Operation Christmas Child. If we can do more boxes, we're going to do more boxes. If we can fill them up, if we can be a blessing in that way. So, look, there's no extra. This is, this is, this is a whole other message, but, you know, when God gives and when God blesses, he expects us to be an outpouring of that blessing in whatever way. Love, grace, forgiveness, whatever, you, whatever he's done for you, really. But even in a financial way, when you continue to give, he continues to bless. It's just an awesome thing. It's a biblical thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's an awesome thing. Just encourage you uh, to just keep that in mind. We can't outgive God. That is not a cliche that is rooted in biblical wisdom and, and truth and teaching. Uh, and we know that to be true. But we all know Coast Community Church always rises above and does that in volunteerism and giving above and beyond. And we just thank you uh, for doing that. All right. We are going to have the offering bag come forward and pray with us offering. Elder Buck has an announcement. Okay, free breakfast next week here for continental breakfast. That'll be pastries and fruit. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So good job, Men's Ministries, just sponsoring that, being a blessing. So guess what? You can even bring somebody. Okay, that'd be a great opportunity to bring somebody. Okay, I got you. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to pray over this offering now. Thank you for keeping me on track, Faith. All right, let's pray. God, we just thank you. We love you. We, we just enjoy being in your presence right now. God, when we just really stop and just think on you and just get in your presence and get in your word and just turn our hearts towards you, God, just, God, everything just gets better. God, there's just always so much more hope. God, there's just a, a new way of, of looking at maybe the same situation we've been trying to do in our own power. God, right now, I just pray that we take this time, that we don't waste it, that we focus on what you have uh, to just put on our hearts today. God, how we can glorify you more, praise you more, worship you more, and be more like Christ. God, that's just our, that's just our desire today. God, if there's just one person who doesn't know Jesus Christ as Savior, as always, we, God, there's nothing greater we love to, to see than, than that new birthday. One more for the kingdom. Another person realizing that they are a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. God, if there's just one who needs to confess with their mouth, believe in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and be saved. God, we just pray that today is that day. God, if there's anyone here not feeling well or not here because they're not feeling well, God, we acknowledge you as healer. We just pray for that healing touch in their life. God, we thank you for what you continue to do uh, with our finances, God, and we just thank you for the money that's in this bag. May this money be used in a way that's going to be beneficial to your kingdom. God, just continue to bless those who continue to give. God, in tithes, gifts, offerings, above and beyond, sacrificially, God, we know that, that you see that, you know that, and God, that, um, again, there's just no way that we can outgive you. It's just a love offering. So God, just have your way with the use of this money. May it be a benefit and a blessing to your kingdom. So God, right now, we just stop and proclaim Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. God, we are here to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And good morning, Coast Community Church. Give Jesus a round of applause, please. Good to see you here on this day. The weather is nice. That's a good thing. Um, on a not good note, I'm sure all of you are quite aware now that um, Israel is at war. Um, and this is going to be radically different than any of the skirmishes that they've had over the past 70 years. This one's going to be significant, very significant. Um, many bad actors that can get involved are significant. Um, but I faith, uh, God will take care. I mean, they are the, they are the chosen people um, that God will provide. Uh, it's just, it's going to be a horrible, horrible, horrible nightmare uh, that will probably last for quite some time. Uh, so let's pause just a moment and be in prayer, and then we'll continue in message time. Lord God, we uh, do thank you for you. And we know that you are a God of greatness and a God of peace and a God of love and a God of power. And we pray today for Israel, the people of Israel, visitors that were in Israel, people that are stranded there now. Um, we even pray, Lord God, today as the, uh, the war has begun, that uh, men, women, and children that are innocent civilians, even in Palestine, um, you'll be with them as well. So be with the people of Israel, give them your strength, Give them your anointing, give them your presence, and one day may they have true shalom. We pray this today in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I don't know um, necessarily what's going on in your life right now. Some of you may be having great things going on in your life. Some of you may have interesting things going on in your life. Some of you may say, nothing really major is going on in my life. And then some people today, either here or listening through live stream, life's a mess. It's just a mess. Um, we could go deeper into what messes look like, but... It, it's not good right now. Life's just kind of a mess. Well, I think we forget sometimes that regardless of where we are in life, good, not so good, great, confusing, interesting, a mess, or absolutely terrible. God wants to hear about all of that. God wants to be with you in all of that. God wants to reach out to you in all of that. There is nothing too great that God would say, no, I'm not dealing with that. There is nothing too small or we would consider insignificant that God doesn't want to touch and address. Jesus is extraordinarily powerful. And praying in his name and using his name and pronouncing his name and sharing his name and lifting up his name is power. Now I want to uh, go into the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to be looking at chapter 5 in just a moment. But in Mark, um, where we're going to begin today, Jesus had just done something very significant um, in, a, in, a, in a region and what was that significant thing? There was a man who was possessed. Possessed by whom? Devils, demons. In fact, he wasn't possessed by just one. He was possessed by many. Now, you may not realize that people are possessed by demons and sometimes more than one. Sometimes they might even say the response from the, the demons within will say, we are legion, for we are many. This man 
was filled with demons. And Jesus had compassion. And I shared with you a couple, three weeks ago what compassion is. Compassion is not just ordinary love. Compassion is a love that searches out and looks at somebody in a predicament they're in or a situation that they're in and love them enough to long for them to be out of that predicament, to be out of that situation. Sometimes we'll just say, well, I love you. But we're not really longing for that person not to be in the mess or the predicament or the state they're in. Compassion is to love and to hurt for where somebody is or for hurt for what they don't know or hurt for their ignorance or hurt for their situation or hurt for the big fat mess in their life and long and be able and do what you can to help them get from here to here and not to leave them where they are. Jesus does not want to leave you where you are. Jesus wants to meet you where you are and take you where he wants you to be. He does not want to leave you where you are. Even if life is great right now, our definition of great and God's definition of great is not the same. Right? And that's a good thing. That means whatever Dean can conceive and, con and conjure up in his little brain um, can be far exceeded, far, far, far exceeded by the actual working and the actual touch of God. There's no comparison to what I can think is good or great to what God thinks is good and great. So we should long for what God sees as good and great, not just what we think might be good or great. Sometimes even our definition of good is by far not defi God's definition of good. What we think is a good idea, sometimes God said, no, 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 that's a bad idea. And sometimes what we think would be great in life, when we get it, we don't know what to do with it. And when we get it, we don't like it. And when we get it, we say, I thought this would have been better than this. That's why if we rely more on what God defines as good and great, that shalom, that peace, that understanding, that, that touch, and that being satisfied will happen. So Jesus does not want to leave people in the predicament that they are in. And this particular guy was possessed by numerous demons. And what did Jesus do? So he confronted the demons. And the demons even came up with an idea knowing that the Son of God was about to kick them out. Their idea? Jesus, you see that herd of pigs over there? Cast us into them. So he did it. He cast the demons, not just one, the demons, into a herd of pigs. And then they heard it off the cliff into the water below. But interestingly, folks, I mean, that would be pretty awesome to see. But you know what? The, the people, they didn't like it. Now, the man who got undemon possessed, he liked it. The people around were amazed, but they didn't like it. How can you not like the work of God? Ladies and gentlemen, there are times you and I don't like the work of God. There's things he expects and we don't like it. There's things he wants and we don't like it. What he sees as good, like I said a while ago, we don't always see as good. What we, he thinks is great is not what we always think is great. So in this given moment, Jesus did a great thing and cast a bunch of demons into a big herd of pigs and they all crashed over the side of the cliff. And the people said... Jesus, you need to leave. Shoo, go. Why? I think two reasons. One, sometimes we like power. 
but we want power that we can control. We don't want raw God power around because raw God power can't be controlled by me. The will and the direction of the holy can't be controlled by me. And also, I think the people in the area were quite practical. Somebody, somebody owned the pigs. They weren't just wild boar running up and down the mountainside. Somebody owned those pigs. So, you say, well, well but, but Dean, uh, I, I didn't think Jewish people liked pigs. True. But who said that this pig herder was Jewish? Doesn't say that. So, somebody owned the pigs. So, do you think the pig owner enjoys seeing his herd of pigs going crazy from being possessed by demons, and then throwing themselves off the side of a cliff. The pig herder was probably not impressed. In fact, people standing around probably got to thinking, if this Jesus guy stands around too long, what else is he going to mess up? Don't know about that Jesus. He sometimes meddles where he don't belong. He sometimes does things we don't really, really, really want. They looked good, but if he hangs around here too long, it won't be just the pigs, ladies and gentlemen. Who knows what he's going to move into next? Who knows what he's going to touch next? Next, it's, it could be a, a, a disaster. Griffin, could you go get my water bottle off the back table, please? Thank you. So, Jesus left. The pigs didn't come back. The demons were still gone. But people wanted Jesus gone. And what did Jesus do? Jesus left. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Much appreciated. So now that's happened. So what comes next? Everybody wants some Jesus until they don't, right? Everybody wants some Jesus until they don't. When he's doing things that we like and doing things that we want and doing things as we think are acceptable to us, we love us some Jesus. And then we stop loving him so much when he meddles and gets involved in things that I didn't really give him permission to get, get involved in. But still, people at this time, and even today, people want some Jesus. So Jesus, verse 21 of chapter 5, the book of Mark. Jesus just left doing the pig thing. And when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake. Anybody know what lake that is? Lake Gennesaret, which is also called the Sea of Galilee got on the boat to the other side of the lake, Sea of Galilee, Lake Gennesaret, a large crowd, oh, we got more people again, crowded around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, okay, so we've gone from helping out some uh, pagan Gentile folk, now he's on the other side of the lake, and no sooner has he gotten to the other side of the lake, somebody wants some Jesus. Who? Jairus. Who is Jairus? He's a leader in the synagogue. So he wasn't just any ordinary, typical Jew. He was a leader in the synagogue. So was his rank in Judaism high up? Absolutely. Was he considered a holy man by Jewish standards? Absolutely. But, but, and there were already people not liking this Jesus guy. So some of the higher-up Jews are still be, they're beginning to question what do we do with this man? But this guy named Jairus, who could have been mocked, laughed at, judged, maybe to some degree demoted in his responsibilities in the synagogue if he hangs out with the wrong crowd. 
Now, Jesus is becoming somebody that people are thinking we shouldn't hang out that much with him. The Jews were thinking that. So this guy named uh, Jairus came. When he saw Jesus, he did one thing. One thing. He fell down at his feet. He didn't just say, hey, Jesus, what's up? He said, hey, Jesus, I need to talk to you for a second. He went up to Jesus and fell down at Jesus' feet. Any self-respecting, upstanding Jewish man of the synagogue doesn't throw his feet, throw himself at anybody's feet. People were used to bowing and nodding to them, but he's a leader in the synagogue, and the first thing he does is he throws himself at Jesus' feet. Not a good look. Not a good look for a Jewish synagogue leader. But this man at this moment in time did not care at all what anybody thought. Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why he didn't care? Because something that mattered to him more than the opinions of people was at stake. See, when something really, really matters to us, really, really, really matters to us, then all bets are off and things change and what they think does not matter anymore. We have a situation here that needs utmost attention here, now, and I don't care what people think. So what's his dilemma? After he's thrown himself down at Jesus' feet, he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. That can change someone's perspective. Please come. And put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. All right. Jewish synagogue leader man does the unthinkable. He throws himself at the feet of this ragtag preacher dude who Jewish leaders are not really liking. Not only that, he begins to plead, beg, long For Jesus to hear him and do something about his dilemma. What's his dilemma? His daughter's dying. What does he want from Jesus? A a, a quick visit? No. He, He pronounced what he believed. If you will just come and touch her, lay hands on her, pray for her, she will get healed and she will live. He didn't say, Jesus, I think if you showed up and did us a little, a, a, little, a little visit, things might turn around a little bit better. At least I hope so. No, 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 no. He was emphatic. Come. My daughter's dying. You come. Touch her. Pray for her. She will get healed and she will live. Strong words coming from a higher up in the Jewish synagogue. Strong words. Words that could get him in trouble. So Jesus went with him. Wow. Jesus went with him. He made a request, a big request, and Jesus said, okay, let's go. Well, a large crowd followed and pressed around him, not shocking. Everybody wanted them some Jesus. So a huge crowd, typically huge crowd, pressed in all around him. Not one or two, not 50 or 60, probably several hundred. Maybe upwards of a thousand people swarmed to get themselves a touch and a look and a see of this Jesus guy. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 12 years. Don't know what she had. Did she have cancer that caused bleeding? Did she have some kind of female problems going on that was causing massive bleeding? Don't know. She had massive bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care. I like that. She had suffered a great deal under what? The care of many doctors. You hear that? So 
She's been bleeding for 12 years, which is suffering enough, but she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. Doctors are awesome. It's God's gift to us. But sometimes, folks, let's be honest, the cure is worse than the problem at hand. My mother-in-law died of cancer. And she was very convinced that the cure was going to be worse than what she had. And sometimes that's true. This lady had been to lots of doctors. She had spent all the money that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she was growing worse. So doctor, 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 doctor. Money, 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 out of money. Hasn't got one bit better. Not one bit. None. In fact, it's worse now than when I started seeing the doctors. But when she heard about Jesus, oh, Jesus. When she heard about, all she had heard, she heard. She never really encountered him. She never really met him. She didn't deal with him. She had what? Heard about him. That was enough for her. See, when things need changed, it doesn't take that much of us wanting to get to some Jesus. When things matter, when things really, really count, we don't need a lot of convincing. Jairus did not need convincing to go throw himself at the, at the feet of the Christ. He didn't need a lot of convincing to go say, Jesus, pray for my daughter and she won't die. He didn't need convinced. He was convinced. And she here, she heard, she heard some gossip, some stories about this Jesus character. She heard about him. That was it. She came up behind him in the crowd. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. She didn't say a word. She didn't say a word. She didn't call out his name. She wasn't doing some kind of lofty prayer as she moves skillfully through the, the crowd, trying to reach this man that she'd only heard about. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She didn't touch him. She touched the edge of his outer garment. That's it. Why? Why did she do that? Verse 28. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes. Wow. Not if I could just get him to lay hands on me. If I can just get him to anoint me with some oil. If I could just get him to hold a prayer vigil for me. If I could get him just to call out my name and present it before Yahweh. No, 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 no. If I can just get close enough to him and touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Not I might be healed. Not I think it might work. Who told her to go touch, her clo touch his clothes? Herself. Who told her that that would be enough? Herself. Who told her this Jesus guy was that powerful? Herself. How did she know? She had heard about him. But she was desperate. I will be healed. I will be healed. Verse 29. Immediately, immediately her bleeding stopped. It didn't just slowly ebb. The second she touched his clothes, the second she touched his clothes, the bleeding stopped. She felt a change in her. And it didn't take much. She had known what this felt like for 12 years. And said she had suffered. The suffering stopped in a flash of a second. 
at the very moment that she touched his clothes. Immediately, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed, free at last from her suffering. It was done. It is finished. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. True. Healing power through this woman when she touched his garment left him to her. He felt it. He knew it. He turned around in the crowd. Now remember, we're talking hundreds, maybe over a thousand people smashing up against the Son of God. But everybody wants some Jesus. He turned around in that mass and asked, Who touched my clothes? Now, if you're one of the followers of Jesus at the time, one of the disciples, one of the apostles, you've been walking around with Jesus for a while now. The crowds are huge. They probably sometimes had to act like a little, you know, like a little bit of a secret service to try to protect the man. They were used to people getting all up on Jesus, wanting to touch, wanting to see as close to him as they could get. So you got several hundred or a thousand people smashing in, trying to just get a glimpse or uh, listen to his voice or just receive a little touch or something. Hundreds of people, thousand people. And he turns around in that mass and says, Who touched me? His disciples had something to say. You see the people (laughs) crowding against you? Like, Jesus. Hint, hint. There are several hundred, maybe a thousand people here. They're all over you like white on rice. And and you're going to ask, who touched me? Well, remember, these apostle disciple folks are still in training. Didn't dawn on them that Jesus knows everything. Didn't dawn on him that Jesus knows everything. The Son of God knows everything didn't dawn on them that something must have significantly just happened for him to say that. He wasn't being random and saying, who touched my holy clothing? He wasn't being arrogant or pompous or rude or obnoxious. He wasn't even asking a silly, stupid question. It was a question with a point. I want to know who just touched me. The type of disciples, apostles should have been smart enough to know something significant just happened for him to say that in this massive crowd. But our friends, the disciples, the apostles, weren't always the sharpest tools in the shed. They were still in training. So not, not a knock against them. They're still learning. Who touched my clothes? But Jesus kept looking around. The disciples are probably thinking, our buddy here is kind of losing it. He said, who touched me? We just told him there's a kabillion people here, and he's still looking. Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Why was she trembling? Why was she scared? First of all, a miracle had just happened, and she knew it. She also 
secondly, heard Jesus begin to say, who touched me? So she knew that he knew. Right? She knew that he knew. She wasn't dumb. (laughs) She wasn't. She knew that he now knew. Did I make a mistake, she may have thought. Was it out of order for me to have touched his clothes? Was I not supposed to receive what I just received? What's he going to say to me? Is he mad at me? Is he going to take back what I just got healed from? Is my healing going to leave? So I don't think she thought all that. I think she thought a lot of things in that. You know, your brain can think about a lot of things in about five seconds. A lot. That's true for her. Is he mad? Did I do something wrong? Am I going to get punished? Is he going to take my healing back? Uh, What's he going to say to me in front of all these people? So she went from having great faith and great expectation to having concern and fear, not knowing what would happen next. So she came front. She told Jesus. She fell at Jesus' feet. a lot of falling at Jesus' feet, huh? Maybe we can learn a lesson. Maybe we should be falling at the feet of Jesus a little bit more often. It seems to work. So she fell at his feet. She told him the whole story. And he said to her, he called her daughter. Not, hey, chick. Hey, woman. Hey, you grubby lady who just touched my holy holy clothing. No. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in shalom. Go in peace. And be freed from your suffering. What did he mean by freed from your suffering? She already was freed from her suffering, from the blood flow, from the disease that she had. She got healed. She already knew that. He already knew that. Healing had occurred. So why did he say, why did he say, go in peace and be freed from your suffering? You know, sometimes we get used to the way things are. This is the way it's always been. This is what we've always done. No matter what I do, this is always the case. And our life often gets built around some circumstances that, that we don't know how to fix or they've just always been there. So she's had to live an interesting life, I'm sure, for 12 years that affected her family relationships. Her, she probably didn't have a man Who wants a bleeding mess? Jewish people are scared, not scared, but they, they, blood and blood and Jewish people, that don't go together. You don't touch blood. She's bloody. Did she have a lot of friends? Probably not. Did she have a husband? Probably not. Did she have family supporting her? I don't know. Probably not. Was she alone? Well, she came to this place alone. Her life probably was centered around the fact that I'm a bleeding mess and it's only getting worse. That was her life. And it defined all of her actions, all of her thoughts, all of her words, who she hung out with, who she didn't hang out with. Everything was centered around that. It was a mess. See, Jesus knew life's about to change for you big time. Big time. Not just your blood not flowing. Your disease is gone. But you haven't seen anything yet. This is just the start, daughter. Stay tuned for more to come. Go and be freed from all of your suffering not just the healing that you just had.
See, sometimes Jesus heals us. Really, Jesus does things in our life to affect the future, not just the moment. So that we can walk in him and move in him and live in him and be with him. She was about to experience life that she hadn't felt in her entire life, especially in the past 12 years. Okay, so we have a woman, heard about Jesus, faith and believed he can do great things. And he did. So Jesus just got through speaking to this lady. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Now, who's with Jesus right now? Jairus. What did Jairus just see? A healing of a woman. Where are they going? To his house. That they're on the route to his house. Why? Because his daughter's sick and dying. Jairus wants to get there. Now, we don't know what Jairus was feeling. Like, do we have to stop and talk to this lady right now? My daughter's dying. I don't know what he was thinking. But he knows where they're going. We're going to my house. My daughter's dying. So while Jesus was still speaking, some people from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Leave the nice teacher alone, Jairus. You tried. Didn't make it there in time. Your daughter's dead. So let Jesus go do what else he's got to do. Bringing him to the house right now is no longer necessary. See, sometimes we think there's just things Jesus can't do. He's called a miracle worker for a reason. You know, remember I told you quite a while back that... uh, Joel and I attended a worship service once. Um, The church shall remain nameless. Um, And the pastor got up and was doing his message and delivering it. And he said, you know, um, people in this day and time, they really believe in all this miracle stuff. (laughs) But we know that that's just not the way it works. That's not typical. And, you know, Jesus didn't go around healing people all the time. Are we right? Right? Whoa, pastor dude. It's not like Jesus went around doing a bunch of healing all the time. That's what he did most of the time. (laughs) He was a miracle worker touching lives on the regular, like all the time. So here we have the pig incident, then we have Jairus coming to him, then we have a a woman with the issue of blood, and now we're back to Jairus. Has Jesus stopped doing any work? No, he's still working. What's he doing? Miracle working. What's he doing? Still touching lives. Touch there, 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 and there. That's what Jesus does. He touches lives, period. Well, it's not like he did it all the time. So they say, Jairus, let's not go to your house. Your daughter's dead. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, told him, not the crowd, not his apostles, not his father, told him, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. And when Jesus spoke that, that had to give some peace to Jairus. I know what you just heard, Jairus. It's very bad news. I heard it. Listen to me. Do not be afraid. Believe. We're not done here yet. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion, rightfully so, with people crying and wailing loudly. What are they crying about? What are they wailing about? Daughter's dead. So rightfully so, they come upon a house where there's a lot of stress, 
a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, tears galore, people screaming and yelling and crying because his 12-year-old daughter just died. He went in to the house and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And how did the people respond? Verse 40. Very short little verse. But they laughed at him. So Jesus, son of God, with Jairus and the three apostles, the three disciples, walk into Jairus' house and, and he says, why, why are you people crying so much? Why are you wailing so much? Why, why all the commotion? She's not dead. She's asleep. And the house bust a laugh and laughed. And la- this dude has lost it. Now, the disciples are still learning. They just dealt with Jesus and who touched my clothes. And now their Jesus mentor guy is saying, the little girl's not dead, she's just sleeping. Okay, Jesus, we hear you. Now, what are they thinking? Uh, She looks pretty dead to us. After he put them all out, when they laughed, what did he do? Out, out, out. Get out. He wanted the unbelievers out. He wanted the scoffers out. He wanted the people who made fun out. He wanted the people who did not have faith out. He wanted the people who didn't believe out, out. So who's left? Maybe the child's mother, Jairus, Jesus, three disciples. The disciples were with him and, and went in where the child was. Jesus, verse 41, he took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum. Did you know at CCC, our worship mascot, that would be Faith, her name is Talitha. Named after this right here. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately. Immediately. Like, how quick? Immediately. How immediately did the pigs get those demons? Immediately. How quickly did the woman with the issue of blood get healed? Immediately. What happened here? Jesus says, Talitha kum. And what happens? Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. Dead people don't walk. She was 12 years old. She's just about to get to that age of what we call bar mitzvah. Guys have bar mitzvahs. Ladies have bar mitzvahs where they come of age. 13. Immediately the girl stood up, began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were what? Completely astonished. Who was astonished? All the people found out that she was alive? My guess is that even the disciples that were Jesus with Jesus at the moment, I think even they were astonished. You see, they're still disciples in training. They're still dits. The di- disciples in training. And everybody's, wow, wow, wow. Never should we stop being wowed by Jesus. But at the same time, we should learn to expect the wow. Because when we expect nothing, we get nothing. 
When we don't expect the extraordinary, we get the ordinary. When we just suffer with our stuff or our situations or our messes that we have made, our Jesus is compassionate and he loves us with a love that wants us to move us to move us from the mess to glory, from a disaster to strength, to lack of faith to faith, to lack of hope to hope, to lack of love to love. He does not want to leave us where we are. He knows better. He has a better plan. He has a better way. But Let's look back at the pig situation. Something great had happened. And the people wanted him to leave. He was messing up their little world. Jairus, synagogue guy, embarrassed himself, according, I'm sure, to his Jewish friends, by throwing himself at the feet of the Messiah. A woman who just kind of heard about Jesus, says, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And she was. And then he goes on to Jairus' house, and the girl's dead. There's laughing at the mere mention that she's not dead, she's sleeping. Talitha, kum, get up. But still to this day, there are people who long to just touch the Christ. And then there are people who just live thinking he can't really do anything for me. And then there's people who who say, I I wish he would just leave me alone. May we be. May we be like Jairus and his faith. May we be like the woman with the issue of blood and had faith. May we be like Jairus in the end who got to see his daughter rise from the dead. May we expect Jesus to do great things. May we expect Jesus to do extraordinary things. May we expect God to move. May we expect God to change things. May we expect God to have a better outcome than the way things are right now. The greatest advocate, the greatest cheerleader, the greatest fan, the greatest doctor, the greatest friend that you could possibly ever have has a name. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And our Jesus does extraordinary things. Amen. Y'all stand with us.
darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are great miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. worship, I wanted to share uh, what God laid on my heart uh, during another song, but it most assuredly ties into this one. Like the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us, come rest on us. That brings to mind how, you know, we, we kind of put our hands on our kids to let them know we're there, you know, maybe a little restraint at times. Hang in there, son. In a world that sees the negative in following a God that sometimes lets bad things happen, when we don't realize there's a bigger plan working and everything it has is interwoven, it's easy to forget that we need to put ourselves under something that's more powerful, more more intelligent than us, more uh, able to see the steps in front of us we cannot see. Just like we can see a little bit further than our children. So Spirit, please rest on us. And help us learn restraint. Help us <laughs> let you make a way. Because there's a lot of things we can't do. And when that time comes, and he and God knows he made that way. All he's going to do is take his hand off and say, it's all yours. I brought you up, but you know what to do.
Amen. Thank y'all for joining us, church. Y'all have an excellent week.